Good morning. Good morning. Just letting everybody get settled in. Good to be here. Nice to see you all this morning. Hi, Ruth. Good to see you. Everybody's starting to gather in for worship this morning on this beautiful, beautiful day that God greeted us with snow in April. God laughs indeed. <laughs> Good to see you all. Nice to see you. Gather in, gather in. Say hello if you're here. It's always nice to know who's watching, who's with me. Everybody's gathering in, gather us in, gather us in, ground us, ground us in you. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi Fred and Mark and Kay and Don and Gary. Nice to see you guys. Glad you're here this morning. We start to gather in for worship. Veronica, good morning. Nice to see you. Hi, Sherry. Good to see everybody here for worship this morning. Ah, oh, we're all starting to come in. This is good. This is good. You can hear the dog. Hey, Kevin. Hi, Kevin and Jen and Ayla and Sarah. Good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, we're just all getting ready. Lucy's out eating her breakfast. She had a rough night, so... I apologize in advance if I have to run to the door. Oh, I see some of my colleagues signing in. Hi, Reverend Angela. This is what it is when you record in advance. You get to check out everybody who's live. Welcome to worship this morning. Good to see you guys. Well, we'll start with some announcements as everybody starts to gather in. Hi, Mom. <laughs> nice to see my mom there this morning. And my dad, I'm sure, too. So um, we'll gather in by starting with some announcement time. Um, I just want to remind you that every day on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live at 10 a.m. and at um, 7.30 p.m. on the weeknight. So Monday through Friday, you'll find a video there. Monday through Thursday, those videos are live. They're live with me, a morning reflection with scripture and song and prayer. And then in the evenings, it's a guided meditation, mostly from Sharon Moon's book, Healing Oasis, and hopefully uh, moving towards uh, returning to the Healing Oasis, her second book, sometime this week. I want to acknowledge that uh, I've been sending out a e-newsletter to, to folks. If you get that, feel free to share it. If you don't get it yet, um, go on to our website at elmsdalecooperativeministry.com, and you'll find that there. Um, the other thing that you'll find there under online worship is the PDF version of our order of service today. So if you wanted to follow along with us, you can certainly, if you're on your computer, you could have two screens open if you know how to do that. One with the order of service to follow along. There's uh, two hymns today that are have words that aren't familiar. And so if you'd like to, uh, to have that order of service up in front of you, you can follow along and pray with me. And you can uh, sing with me too for some of those words. So that's under online worship. The other thing that you can do online is donate. And so if you're wondering what to do with your weekly offerings, um, there's three different options and you can find all of that on the website under donations. So the lots on the website now, it's slowly being built. Uh, I'm working on it as I can and learning as I go. And so thank you for my your patience with me around that. So welcome to all of you that have joined us since I said hello, Sherry and Dennis. Hi, Dennis, uh, Judy and Anne and James. Good to see you all here this morning. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge that today's prayers and the hymns and the sources that I've got them from, you can see Miss Lucy wandering in. I've got all my stuff in your way, don't I? Okay, gotta move my Lucy stuff so that she can, there we go, bud. You gonna get up there? There. I'm gonna make sure the dog is comfortable, you know. Here we go. So, oh, hi, Betty. And uh, good morning to McDuff from Miss Lucy this morning. Nice to see you, Wendy. Good to be here. So um, acknowledging that our prayers and our poems and our liturgy is coming from other sources that will be acknowledged in the, um, 
in the description of this video. So please look for those there. Look for the links to read more prayers and see more songs and to um, check in with what all of those people are doing. Thank you to those who have written prayers for your gifts of liturgy and to those who have written songs and music. Thank you for your gifts. And good morning to Bill and Eunice and Betty and Steve. It's good to see you all. So as we move in from um, this time of announcements, I wanted to begin um, before our acknowledgement of place, and we will do that, with a gathering prayer. 19th century um, philosopher and theologian J. K. Chesterton uh, once wrote this, Angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. Never forget that the devil fell by the force of gravity. He who has faith has fun. Isn't that great? So today is Holy Humor Sunday, and I will share a little bit more about that in the reflection, but let us gather in prayer. Good and gracious God, we laugh as a sign of the joy you have brought into the world through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Help us to see light through your eyes, eyes of grace and forgiveness, and help us to laugh when the world presses in around us and we are afraid. All God's people said, Amen. And we do acknowledge place. We acknowledge that in this place where all of us are worshiping this morning, regardless of where we are in Canada, we are on laws that for many of us are on the unceded territory of our indigenous people. In this area, it is the territory of the Mi'kmaq people here in Nova Scotia. And I pray that we continue to live with respect for this land and we work harder to live in peace and friendship with all of the people. We light our Christ candle this morning to remind us of the light of Christ, the light of Christ that is in each and every one of us and goes with us wherever we go. The light of Christ be with you. Let us join together in our call to worship. Sing a new song. A joyful melody of springtime glory and rebirth. Sing praise to our still laughing Easter God, who has rolled away the bindings of yesterday. Immerse your anxiety and despair in the fountain of new birth. We place our visions and hopes at Jesus' feet. For God has taken ordinary things and made them extraordinary. Let us sing a new song. Our opening prayer for Holy Humor Sunday, let us pray. You smiled and the sun burst through the shadows of chaos. You chuckled and the platypus splashed in creation's fountain. You laughed and all that is good and beautiful was given shape by you, imaginative God. Snickering at the feeble attempts of the evil one. You showed us. You showed us how to resist temptation, giggling at sin's desperate desire to hold on to us. You released us by your love. Howling with laughter at death's foolish belief that the tomb could hold you, you burst forth into the kingdom as the stars peeled with joy laughing Jesus. As you fill us with new life, may we delight in sharing it with others. As you tell us the good news which can never be taken from us, may we rejoice in offering it to the broken, the sad, the lonely. As you tickle us with grace, may we give it away with laughter on our lips and joy in our hearts spirit of Easter. God in community, holy and one, our hearts overflow with wonder as we lift the prayer Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we move towards our opening hymn. And I wrote this especially for you, especially for this morning. So I hope you like it. Um, I'll try it. You don't, you don't have the words, so I'll try and sing it clearly. It was posted, I think, on Friday on our website as well. So if you'd like to read the words again, they are definitely there. Um, it's a little silly. It was divinely inspired. It took about 15 minutes to write. Um, and so let's give it a go, shall we? It goes to the tune of Take Time to Be Holy. distracted when we were doing our opening prayer for Holy Humor, Humor Sunday. If some of you had your ears very carefully peeled, you heard the cat using her litter box. Wasn't that <laughs> just the perfect background for a, a prayer? And we make plans and God laughs. And she just zoomed on by. She says, don't talk about me, mom. Okay, let me find this again. <laughs> I'm using a teleprompter, this really cool app, and so, but it skipped on me, so I have to go back. This is the good thing about technology. All right. Take two. Are you ready, guys? Here we go. Bring our song back. There we go. to join me in the call to reconciliation. None of us likes to look silly or foolish, but what is sillier? Chasing after the world and all its gaudy trinkets, which flatter our souls, or being a fool for Christ, imitating him in service to others, offering ourselves in joy and in love to the world, let us admit to God the foolish choices that we make each and every day. 
as we pray, saying our prayer of confession together. You know better than we do. Amuse God what is important and what important people we believe we are, believing we have to be serious all of the time. We miss out on the joy of your creation, choosing to feast on the pain of the world. We skip the picnic offered in paradise, clinging to the despair which is our best friend. We ignore Jesus, who can bring us home to your heart. Forgive us, heart of joy, and make us open to the startling and upside down ways in which you work. Fill us with Easter's laughter. Fill us with your healing joy. Fill us with the love poured into us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Please take this moment in silent prayer between you and God. Amen. The Gospels tell us over and over again of the joy which comes through Christ. When Jesus was around, lives were changed, the sick were healed, the sorrowful began to laugh. They laughed with joy. The good news is that this joy is now given to us. Through the Holy Spirit, we are gifted with joy. We are sent forth to bring good news to the oppressed, to bring healing to the broken, to anoint everyone with the oil of gladness. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven every time, my friends. Amen. So I don't have a storybook for the kids today, but I do have a funny story. So I asked my mom for some stories that I might share um, as I was thinking about this day. And this day is a funny day. It's a day about funny stories. And so I thought I'd share one with you. So this story happened when I was probably about, I have a couple stories actually, but this first one happened when I was about two years old, maybe three, probably about three. And my mom used to have under the, under the bathroom counter, she had this beautiful pink jar and it had like a pearl kind of lid on the top of it. And you know what was inside that jar in the bathroom? When you lift it off that lid, there was this beautiful smelly powder that just smelled like roses. It was the most marvelous thing. And not only that, but it had this gigantic big puff, this puffy thing. And I remember my mom, my mom called that dusting powder. It was called dusting powder and I love to sneak a little sniff of that stuff. It was amazing stuff. Some of you still might use it, dusting powder. So this one time my grandparents were staying with us. I don't know why, they just used to come and visit from the valley sometimes. And it was in our home in Lower Sackville. And my mom had gone out shopping. And while she was away, I've always wanted to do nice things for my mom and I can quite, I can tell you a few stories. They don't always turn out the way that I want or elicit the reaction that I want, but I always try to do nice things for my mom and my dad. Even when I was little, even when I was three years old, I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to dust the living room for my mom. My mom has always been somebody who likes everything very, very tidy. And I thought, I am going to help my mommy and I am going to dust the living room. So I went into the bathroom and I opened up the cabinet and I got that beautiful pink box with the opal lid and I brought it out into the living room and I took that big puff and I dusted every single surface of that living room until everything was covered in that wonderful rose smelling powder. It was magnificent. I was so proud. Oh, I was so proud. I couldn't wait for my mother to come home. And just then, 
my wonderful poppy, my grandfather, saw what I had done and he said, what did you do? And I was very proud of myself and I said, I dusted for mummy. Well, when my mother got home, my grandfather made her stay in the kitchen until the living room was completely vacuumed because that's not the kind of dusting that my mummy would have appreciated. So I think that's kind of a funny story, how we think about words. I thought dusting, like the dusting powder that you put on your body was for dusting the living room too. What did I know? I was three. But you know what we got out of that? Even though my mom would have been really mad and my grandfather had to do all kinds of work, we got a wonderful memory. And it's a story that I am 45 years old. Shh, 45. So that story is 42 years old and we still tell it in my house with so much joy. It was actually kind of a terrible thing that I did, but it turned out to be one of the most wonderful stories of my childhood. Isn't that great? The last story I'll tell you real quick um, is a story that my, my mom tells about um, me as a little girl. And so you'll hear a little bit if you stick around for the sermon about um, how I, um, I heard God's call really early in my life. I used to talk to Jesus all the time. Jesus was my best friend and, and still is. And I used to have private prayers and shows and dances for Jesus and sing to God for help. But the one story that comes up a time and time again is how, especially once I told everybody I was going to be a minister, they, they all knew. I didn't know, but everybody else knew. And they said, oh, I remember when it was time to eat a special dinner and we would ask if you would pray and your brother would roll his eyes and say, oh, great, the food is going to get cold. Because I would go on and on and on and on, kind of like I do now. <laughs> Some things never change. So those are my funny little stories for you guys this morning. Would you guys like to have a song with me? I want to sing um, a song this morning, and I need your help. So when I, while we're praying, I want the parents and the grandparents and everybody else that's watching um, to to help remember this song so that you can sing it along with me. I don't have music with it, but I think you know it. So it's when you're happy and you know it. But let's pray first. Repeat after me. Dear God, help us to laugh even when things are hard. Help us to smile when we remember funny stories. Help us to share our stories with our friends and our family. God, thank you for laughing. Thank you for joy. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. And I'm set up here in such a way that I really can't get up and dance. So stay tuned because there will be a dance video coming out in the next week or so that you'll get to see me boogie all day. But for right now, I'm going to dance in my chair and we're going to sing, If You're Happy and You Know It. Do you know this one? Okay. And we're going to do uh, maybe just three verses. Let's see. We'll see how it goes. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. Do it! If you're happy and you know it, what should we do now? Any ideas? If you're happy and you know it, stick out your tongue. If you're happy and you know it, stick out your tongue. If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, stick out your tongue. If you're happy. 
happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! Last time. If you're happy and you know it, do all four. <laughs> hooray! If you're happy and you know it, do all four. Hooray! If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, do all four. <laughs> Hooray! Thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you adults that don't have children with you for putting up with my silliness. I hope you join in too. I hope you're dancing like no one is watching. I hope you're singing like you've never sung before. Today is a day of laughter and joy. Amen. Amen. So, let's see where we are. <laughs> so we move into our time of scripture. And the first scripture I have from you is a favorite of mine. And I, I, I pray this all the time. I pray this at weddings. I pray it at funerals. I pray it when I'm happy. I pray it when I'm sad because it reminds us that there is a time for everything. Reading from Ecclesiastes 3, just verses 1 through 4 today. Everything has its time. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to heal and a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. We continue our scripture by reading, um, reading and singing through the Psalms. Psalm 126 is where we are today. And Psalm 126, and I'm using the um, responsive version from Voices United. And in this responsive version, there is a refrain see if I can remember it. I might have to go to the piano for a second. Yep, I do. I'll be right back. Stay tuned. <laughs> Not you, Lucy. It goes like this. All right, to get that in my poorly tuned piano, many of us are regretting not having tuned pianos right now. Let's try it. We'll sing a song of joy. We'll sing the song of joy. Not even close, but that's what we're using. We'll sing a song of joy. We'll sing the song of joy. That's closer. We'll sing a song of joy. We'll sing the song of joy. When God brought Zion's captives home, it seemed to us like a dream. But then our mouths were full of laughter and our tongues uttered shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, God has done great things for them. Truly, God has done great things for us and therefore we rejoice. We'll sing a song of joy, we'll sing the song of joy. Restore our fortunes, O God, as streams refresh the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seeds for sowing, shall come home with songs of joy, bringing in their sheaves. We'll sing the songs of joy, we'll sing the song of joy. This ends the reading of our psalm. And we move into a reading from the Gospel of John. Reading from the Gospel of John, we're reading um, from the voice version of the Bible. No, we're not. 
We're reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I stopped reading from The Voice. We're using that for our morning reflections at 10 a.m. We're reading this morning John 20, verses 19 to 31, the New Revised Standard Version. It's titled, Jesus Appears to the Disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the story of Jesus and Thomas. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see those marks of the nails on his hands, and I put my finger in the marks on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And finally, the purpose of this book from the Gospel of John, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life, in his name. May God add to our understanding the reading of these holy scriptures. Let's prepare for a time of reflection. Will you pray with me? Holy One, may the words that I'm about to share reach the hearts that need to hear them. May the thoughts that I share inspire us all to think on you as we go into our day and into our week ahead. And may all of us, whenever and wherever we are listening, know that we are not alone because you are always with us. And you are with us today as we listen to these words. Let them stir in our hearts what you would have them stir. Amen. Before the pandemic, I had planned to be on vacation this week with my wonderful cousin Joe in Bathurst. And I told our worship committee I was going to be back for Sunday because I took an extra day in March break that I didn't actually get after all. But we planned a fun and different kind of service that, that day. There was going to be a congregational hymn sing with prayers. And in the reflection time, we were going to do a ask the minister anything. So don't worry, you haven't missed your chance. We will do that another time. But this, this wasn't part of my plan. So I started thinking about the tradition of Holy Humor and Holy Hilarity Sunday. And some say that this tradition grew out of another practice from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, the week after Easter was celebrated as Bright Week. The entire week, um, ironically enough, not Saturday, was a time when they played jokes and laughed with one another. And they did this to celebrate, celebrate all through the week. Some say it was because early theologians like Augustine and Gregory of Nyssa wrote as if God had played some kind of practical joke on the devil by raising Jesus from the dead. Rises Paschalis, the Easter laugh, this idea that Christ's resurrection is the greatest joke of all time. It's a reason to laugh. And my God, we need a reason to laugh right now. And I'll be honest, I don't feel a lot like laughing these days. And sitting here in front of you, telling jokes, would be disingenuous and quite frankly unkind because I actually know that I'm not as funny as I think I am. Oh, 
That's a big confession. <laughs> I thought I might share some funny stories though, just the same. So I asked my friends and my family, you heard a couple from uh, Children's Time today, some funny stories that maybe I told or funny short stories that I've shared with me about me, about things that are funny that happened in my life. And you know what I heard? I heard stories that my friends told that I had totally forgotten about and I laughed. I heard stories about me that I did forget or maybe I wished I could forget and will not be repeated here and oh I laughed. I heard stories from my ministry colleagues about their times in ministries and I laughed. I even heard stories about myself as a little girl that I had never heard before and I laughed. Telling our stories matter. Our stories aren't always funny, but there's often humor in many of our life stories. So this morning, instead of a sermon or a reflection, I thought I'd share a part of my story. And it is my story. It's the story of my call. The short story version, not the novel version. Although you might want to grab a cup of coffee or tea right now because this isn't short. But where do you actually have to go, really? It's not necessarily a funny story, but it has funny moments. You know who I think laughs most at this story? God. You know that saying, God laughs when we make plans? I know this to be true. It was not my plan to be a minister. My plan has always been something else. My mother shared stories with me about talking to God, about praying and singing to Jesus in the privacy of the evening. And you know what, that reminded me that God was on my heart and on my lips from the moment that I could talk. And I'll tell you more of those stories someday, but for now, know that I was really involved in my church. From an early age, I sang in the choir. Later, I taught Sunday school, I went to church camps, I was confirmed, I was a youth rep on church boards. I rarely missed a Sunday, thanks to my parents dragging me out of my bed early in the morning. But once I got there, I loved sitting with my head on my dad's shoulders on Sunday mornings, him making jokes and my mom giving him evil looks. <laughs> when I was in high school, I fancied the idea of being a doctor, maybe. I was really good in science, I love science. I didn't really know what I wanted to be, but I had great grades and I really, I could have been anything. I settled, much to the dismay of my honors history teacher, John McDonald, to be a lab rat, oh, I mean a lab tech. <laughs> that was my plan. And while in college, I moved on from working at Canadian Tire to working at bars, staying out way too late partying to bother going to church on Sunday morning. I went just enough so that people wouldn't ask my mother too often where I was. Church held no interest for me anymore. It wasn't relevant in my life. It wasn't meaningful. I had other important things. The world was calling. The world was my oyster. And I went to school. I graduated. Everything was going according... Ugh, no, it wasn't. I didn't get a job. There weren't any lab technology jobs anymore. Not here. That was not part of my plan. So I took blood at the hospital. I washed dishes and fed lab rats at Dalhousie Medical School. I was a receptionist and warranty clerk at Forbes Chevrolet Oldsmobile Cadillac. Forbes Chevrolet Oldsmobile Cadillac. I was an assistant manager at a bar. I waitressed. And eventually, I moved out to British Columbia to be a lab technician. Not in the hospital, but in the quality control department of an herbal pharmaceutical company. I did eventually find work in a hospital. I found a nice boyfriend, a nice apartment, a couple of cats. I had good friends. I was 24 years old. Life was finally going according to my plan. February 9th, 1999 was a bright, sunny winter morning. And unlike most mornings in the Fraser Valley, it was not warm and wet but crisp and cold and the surface of everything was a sheet of ice. I actually almost hit a woman when I slid into traffic at the bottom of the hill of my subdivision. But once I got on the freeway, I thought it would be a little bit safer, but I noticed that everyone was driving like they usually do, but I knew better. I'm from the East Coast after all. I moved to the outside lane where there was a little bit more space between cars. And then I saw a berry farm truck 
jump into my lane just in front of the car I was following. She fishtailed, I fishtailed, and we ended up side by side in the road. The berry truck kept going and she looked at me and she mouthed, are you okay? And just as I nodded and said yes, I saw my life end in her face and the light of the headlamps blinding me through the side window as the truck that had been following way too closely and way too fast crushed me in my car between them. My physical life did not end that day, but life as I knew it did. That wasn't my plan. I avoided the freeway after that. Instead of taking 30 minutes to get to work, my commute took over an hour each way. And that was the short version. Many times it took longer because I stopped at every bathroom along the way for what I later learned were panic attacks. I actually allowed two hours each way, four hours of commute every day just to get to work. And eventually I stopped going. I stopped going out with friends, I broke up with my boyfriend, I was lost, I was alone, I was afraid. That was not my plan. But eventually I got a job in the hospital in my own town. One day I noticed one of my lab colleagues praying at lunchtime. And I had been planning to go back to church because I knew it might help. My friends at home, my friends and family and my church community at home had been praying for me. And so I asked her if I could go to church with her. I mean, we were in the Bible Belt. There are more churches there than I think bars here. I started going to a Mennonite Brethren Community Church. I sang, I prayed, I testified. It was there that I remembered who I was and to whom I belonged. It may not have been the right church for me. The theology was not in line with my own. But singing and praising helped reconnect me with my spirit. And I am forever grateful for that public display of faith. A simple prayer said over food that was a beacon of hope for me in one of the darkest and loneliest times in my life. I was still struggling though. In 2000, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder with depression and anxiety and an additional panic disorder. I don't do anything small. I was medicated and then I struggled between numbness and the fire of panic every day. I struggled every night with nightmares. It affected my work, my relationships, and my health. This was not my plan. When the physiotherapist treating me for compressed vertebrae suggested yoga, oh, I tell you, I laughed. Yoga was for pot-smoking hippies and people who only grew food that, or ate food that grew vertically or, you know, whatever hippies ate. And then when a psychologist suggested I try yoga, well, I listened. I caved. And I bought a Crunch Fitness yoga video. Crunch fitness, kind of like the Tai Bo of the day. And it was a video. I put it in the VCR. It was a time. And from that first moment, you know, there was no philosophy or breathing or flowery language. It was just fitness, but I fell in love with it. My therapists were right. It helped my back. It helped me sleep. Yoga helped me reconnect with my body. And I'm forever grateful to those therapists who somehow knew I needed something more than a pill, something more than a laser beam to heal myself. At Christmas that same year, I reconnected with my high school prom date, Ian Curlett. Within two months, he was in the Vancouver airport proposing, and by April, I was moving back to Nova Scotia. I had a lab assistant job to come home to, an apartment to come home to, a man to marry. Life was finally a-going according to my plan. I was attending United Church again. And that summer, I ran into an old friend, Jenny Kirstead, at Berwick United Church camp. She looked great. She just glowed, and I wondered what she was up to, and she said she owned a yoga studio. And she invited me to attend classes at her Halifax studio that September. That first class was nothing like my crunch yoga video. 
the one that I knew by heart by now that always needed the tracking fixed. It was filled with philosophy, with breathing, with comforting cues and flowery language that helped me understand why this practice that I'd been doing was connecting me back to myself and my sense of the divine. I was hooked. Shortly after I got married, I found a job in the hospital as a lab technologist again. Life was finally going according to my plan. PTSD, PTSD didn't get better because I moved home. Yoga helped, church helped, but PTSD doesn't just go away that easily. It's still with me. I was in the middle of a lawsuit in BC at the time and I wasn't doing well at work. I called in sick a lot. A lot. I didn't let anyone know that I wasn't just a flake, that I was actually suffering from a serious mental illness. I was ashamed. And my shame lost me my job. My brother in law gave me a job as a busboy at the Five Fishermen. I was lost. I was smoking more cigarettes than ever drinking more than anyone should. This was not my plan. Eventually my lawsuit settled in my favor and I could help us buy a house. And we bought my father's family home in Dartmouth. I got back on track with my yoga practice at a local studio. I got a job as a lab tech in a quality control department. And then eventually I got back into the hospital. We went to church every Sunday, I sang in the choir again, I sat on church boards, I learned to make the PowerPoints for worship on Sunday mornings. Life was finally going according to my plan. On April 5th, 2005, I went into labor with our first child. On April 7th, yes, you heard that right, just over 32 hours later, I finally delivered my first baby. I won't go into the gory details, but I was nearer to death that day than I've ever been in my life. As they were taking me away to surgery, I passed the baby, baby Lillian, to her dad and I said, no, you stay here. You stay here with the baby. You see, I thought I was going to die and I didn't want her to be alone. When I was laying on the table and feeling life slip away, I prayed. And I was not alone. There was no fear, just peace. I was prepared to leave that world, even if this wasn't my plan. I didn't die that day, obviously, but I was forever changed. That day, God called me to be a mother. It was a long recovery, but two and a half years later, we were ready to try again. I always thought I wanted four kids, but Lillian changed that. Lillian, who took 32 hours to come and then stayed up every moment of her life for the next two and a half years, who had to see everything and be in everything, made me question if maybe she was enough. And she was. But I didn't want her to walk through this world alone, and so we decided to have another baby. And we decided to have another baby and life was good. I was working again in a lab at the hospital, now in my favorite department in blood transfusion services. My yoga practice was healing me. I was off all medication. I was active in my church. Life was finally going according to my plan. Then out of the blue, I got a call from Jenny. Remember the yoga teacher? She asked me if I ever considered opening a yoga studio and I said, girl, I'm not even a yoga teacher and I'm pregnant. That wasn't part of my plan. Well, Miss Leela was born on August 31st of 2008 without any complications. And she and I started yoga teacher training just three weeks later. That spring, I started to build my yoga studio in Dartmouth, and on August 24th of 2009, we opened up. We had over 2,000 unique clients, 4,000 on our newsletter, 15 teachers on the schedule, and just as many volunteers. 
and our studio became a hub for the community. I wrote a curriculum to teach folks to become yoga teachers. Life was finally going according to my plan. One thing that yoga taught me was that my connection to my body, my mind, and my spirit was deeply rooted in my faith. I never shied away from sharing the teachings of Jesus alongside the teachings of yoga and Buddhism. That never felt weird to me. And I started leading specialty classes in my yoga studio, classes at Advent and Lent, and they were surprisingly well attended by all kinds of different students, Christians and Muslims and Hindus and agnostics and more. My mission has always been to help others connect with their own sense of faith. Whatever that was. It didn't have to be faith like mine, but connect to a deep sense of faith through yoga. Like the great mystic Thomas Merton once wrote, I wouldn't understand my Christian faith the way that I do if it weren't for the light of Buddhism. And I would feel the same about my faith. I wouldn't understand my faith if it weren't for the light of yoga. I finally felt like I was living into a calling of some kind. I felt closer to God than I've ever felt. And it showed up in wonderful ways. People started to call my yoga studio their yoga church, not even just my classes, all my classes. People used to say, you know, if you had a church, I'd come. And I thought, shh, stop it. But it was a community. My dear friend Dennis, who I met at the studio, said he doesn't think it was an accident that there was such a sense of community there. And it was no accident. It was very intentional. Much to my accountant's dismay, sorry Mike, I always cared more about the community and connecting people than I ever did about the bottom line. I felt we were doing God's work, loving our neighbor and one another, and that little studio always had exactly what it needed to keep going. We paid our bills, we paid our teachers, and we thrived. So many friendships, this is the proudest thing about this, so many friendships and lifelong bonds were created in that studio that are stronger today than they ever were. Life finally felt like not only was it going according to my plan, it kind of felt like maybe it was going according to God's plan too. I started attending a yoga teacher training program to upgrade my skills and part of that training involved chanting a mantra every day, twice a day around um, around prayer beads, three times, 108 prayer beads. And it went like this. Om Trayambakam Mujamahe Sugandim Pushti Vardhan Udvar Ukamiva Bandhanan Ritual Mukshiya Mamratat. So when you say that 108 times, it's very, very fast. It's in your mind. Om Trayambakam 108 times, three times, twice a day. Loosely translated, it meant Om or reverence to Shiva, the three-eyed one, who I always translated in my mind's eye as the Trinity, as God, the great Trinity. God who, no, I just realized that computer came unplugged. Let me get that plugged in or else we're, I'm gonna lose you. And I don't wanna do that. Let's see, oh, I got it. Oh, no, I don't. Stay tuned. <laughs> You can hear the cat is still running around crazy. I think I got it. Yeah. Everything is breaking. So I broke the iPad broke. I'm gonna send a candle on my lap. Um, so we're filming on the, the phone today. I might have to hold that for the rest of the time. No, I think we got it. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So where was I? Oh yeah, I was explaining the mantra to you. So the mantra the mantra meant Om to Shiva, the three-eyed one, uh, reverence to God, uh, who when, we, when I always heard the three-eyed one, I thought about the Trinity, the three-in-one God that I was so integral to my faith. And it says, God who is like a good gardener, pluck me from the vine, please pluck me from the vine, from the creepers, like a cucumber, before I rot on the ground, every day. Over 600 times, I was praying to God to pick me from the vine and use me according to God's will. No wonder I felt a shift. I created my own mission statement in that course that still holds true to this day. I know that if I'm following this, 
then my life is going according to God's will. It's I surrender to the will of the divine and I trust, I surrender to the will of God and I trust the divine to lead me. On a Friday night check-in on that course, I turned to my classmates with my tears streaming down my face and I said, I think God's calling me to be a United Church minister. And they all clapped and they cheered and somebody said, it's probably Sherry Zach, said, geez, it's about time. Everything I thought I knew, every plan I thought was mine, every plan that didn't fall through, and every plan that did, led me right to this moment. And in that moment, in that moment of saying those words out loud, I committed fully to being a yes to God as, me, as long as it didn't mean a no to God's first calling to me as a mother. I entered a period of deep discernment that eventually led me to a bachelor's degree in philosophy and religious studies from St. Mary's University, a master's degree in divinity from the Atlantic School of Theology, and will lead to hopefully two more degrees. I was ordained with my children by my side. I was surrounded by friends and family. And by then, that family included my ex-husband, who is now one of my dearest friends. That wasn't part of the plan either. None of this was. But God laughs when we make plans. There are many, many stories to tell, and I will someday. But today, this is enough. Probably more than enough. The point is this. God has always known the plan for my life, even when plans didn't accord, go according to how I thought they should be. Every step, every bump, every detour led me right to this moment. I never thought that I would be ministering to you from my living room, but my life even prepared me for this. We are called to follow Jesus. We are called to expect the unexpected. God gave us free will and we can choose to follow whatever path that we want to follow. But God laughs when we make our own plans, not maliciously, but because God has always known who you are and who you were meant to be. And right now, my friends, it sometimes feels more like crying, more like a time to cry. And I want you to cry. Lament is good. Lament is something that our hearts need. We need to cleanse ourselves of all that weighs heavy on us and lift it up to God. We have to ask God why. This is good. This is okay. This is acceptable in God's sight and expected. There is no unexpected with God. But like Ecclesiastes says, we are also called to laugh too. This is a time to lament and this is a time to laugh. I encourage you like I did to reach out to your friends and families and start to share stories. Take time and think about all the things in your life that led you here to this very moment. Whatever you are, whether you're at the top or whether at your bottom, I want you to know that God is with you. Be prepared to expect the unexpected. God's head must shake when we make plans that don't align with what God wants for our lives. But like a good parent, God is beside us even when we think that we are in control, ready to catch us when we fall every single time. And when God catches us, God laughs. Laughs with joy when we finally see what God is calling us to do and be. My friends, let us laugh with God. Let us believe. Let us be. Amen. I'm waiting. <laughs> Amen. It is so good to share stories with you and to uh, open up to you in this way. It feels weird to do it when I can't see your faces and I don't know if you're with me, but I know that you're with me. I can picture you in my mind's eye and I'm grateful for each and every one of you for allowing me this space, um, a space that feels safe, to be vulnerable, to be authentically myself, 
and to come to you again and again and share the stories of my life. I'm grateful to be your minister. Thank you. Can we say our new creed together? Is it affirmation of our faith? Amen indeed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us and we are not alone. Thanks be to God. And we are all laughing, laughing indeed, laughing at autocorrects, laughing at one another, laughing at snow on an April morning, laughing, laughing at life. And let's continue to, um, to laugh, to laugh. Um, this is a, this is a, a little song that I found online and the description will be in the, um, will be in, in, or the, what am I trying to say? I lost my words. Where this came from is what I'm trying to say. Where this came from will be in the description of the video after. It's called We Lack the Gift of Laughter. It It's going to the tune of Oh Jesus I Have Promised. I've never sung this before, so it could be really funny just in the nature of me trying to sing it, um, but I hope it goes okay. So it's um, to Oh Jesus I Have, excuse me, Oh Jesus I Have Promised. Um, and so here we go. Thank you. 
So it's our invitation to the offering. I want to thank you if you've been able to make a financial contribution, either through our website, ellensdalecooperativeministry.com, or by sending um, your, your envelopes to the office. Um, but this time is about dedicating those financial offerings, but also dedicating something else, dedicating ourselves and our lives to follow Jesus. I want you to hold out your hands. Hold them out. I want you to picture in your hands this week something that you can do or say, and maybe it's sharing a memory with someone that you think um, you think they would remember. But let me tell you, trust that the memories that you have of other people sometimes are not the memories they have of themselves. Maybe sharing that memory with them um, will bring them great joy this week. So maybe that's what you're going to commit to do this week. Something that you commit to do that has a way of saying to your neighbors and your community, I love you that says, I care. Put that in your hands. I want you to think about that as you're offering this morning. Take that moment. Imagine all of those things there, the commitment that you're about to make in your hands. And then as you offer that to God, let us pray. Oh God, you have blessed us. We find it hard to name and explain your blessings so that they make sense to others. Yet they are real. We are grateful for friends, for faith, for freedom. Now we offer these gifts in thankfulness and in joy. We give money and rejoice about it. We give our hearts. We can't explain it, even to ourselves, as we offer these gifts. We rejoice because this offering of money and this gift of commitment to one another is for the use of the good of the world. In Jesus' name, we offer these prayers. Amen. Our doxology is Grant Us God. I don't have the music for it, um, but if you know it, sing it with me. I'm going to find it just so that I try and sing it on some semblance of the tune. I think my ears stayed in bed this morning, but we'll see how it goes. Grant us, God, the grace of giving with a spirit large and free that ourselves and all our living we may offer faithfully. And God does receive all the gifts that we offer in God's name. Let us come together for a prayer, um, a pastoral prayer for Holy Humor Sunday. Let us pray. O oh God, giver of joy and laughter, we thank you for giving us these gifts. For the moments of laughter and unbridled joy you give to us. For opportunities to laugh at ourselves. For the belly laughs of children. For friends and family who love us because of our quirks and not just in spite of them. For artists who give us the opportunity to see the world through the surreal for the courage to smile, even when difficulties arise. For those who have hope, even when others think there is no hope. For saints in the Lord who overflow with laughter and spread your joy to all of us. For the words of Jesus that defy our logical minds. For teaching us that we can be born again. For the woman who finds a lost coin and calls her friends and neighbors to celebrate. For the absurdity of a camel trying to fit through the eye of a needle. For the father of the prodigal son who is willing to look like a fool as he returns to greet his son. For the generosity of the landowner who will pay workers a whole day's wages when they only worked one hour. For tiny bits of faith that can move entire mountains. For the reality that nothing can live unless it first dies. For the great reversal of the gospel. For the greatest joke of all time. That the last shall be made first. That the rejected stone became the cornerstone. That those who wish to become great must serve. That the lost will be found. That the small will become great. That though you are wisdom... You choose to forget our mistakes, that when we are weak, your, your strength shines through us. O oh God, giver of joy and laughter, 
We thank you for giving us these gifts. Thank you for the gift you give us that allows us to enjoy these things to the full. We can laugh because of the most amazing thing of all, that you conquered death, that the tomb is empty, that light shone so bright that it overcame the darkness. Our hearts are heavy lately, God, and we give thanks for all who are helping right now in any way. We pray for all who are sick, we pray for all who are dying. We pray for all who are sad. We pray for all who are lonely. We pray for all who are grieving. We pray for all who are afraid. We pray for all who are in danger. God, be with all who need you exactly how they need you right now. Open all of our hearts to be able to see and feel your presence in our lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. Our closing prayer is number 624, Give to Us Laughter. And I'll be singing it from the Red Book. And I do have some music to play, just a moment. And then we'll have a closing prayer and then we'll be ready to go off into our day with all the exciting adventures we have to the basement, to the living room, to the kitchen, maybe to the yard. Ooh, the exciting things we have planned for today. <laughs> Let's sing, give us to this laughter. indeed this and every day our closing prayer for a holy humor Sunday Lord grant me a joyful heart and a holy sense of humor please give us the gift of faith to be renewed and shared with others each day teach us to live this moment only looking neither to the past with regret or to the future with apprehension let love be our guide and our life be a prayer so my friends, go in laughter, go in grace, keep the Lord in your heart and a smile on your face. Amen. So let me ask you this real quick. As I was singing that little ditty I wrote, Take Time to Be Happy, I thought, I wonder if I should share that on the COVID kitchen party ultimate thing, the ultimate Nova Scotia kitchen party. What do you think? I'll wait to hear from you. I don't know if I should or not. I'm thinking I might. I might just do it just like this. It's Sunday after all. Maybe folks will be interested. I don't know. It feels a little, it feels nervous to do that. I, I share with you guys here, but that's a, it's a bigger forum. But I think it might make some people smile. So it might be a good thing to do today. Maybe I'll do that. Um, and so I'll do that. I will. Oh, I, I, yeah, okay. So there's a few of you saying yes, yes, yes. Okay, I will, I will, I will. So watch for it. Please feel free to share it. Um, and, uh, Please tune in with me uh, Monday morning at 10 a.m. I'll be back with morning reflections and we are um, reading the daily office with prayers and uh, and song as well. And then at 7.30 every night, we are going to um, 
7.30 every night we have an evening meditation. And all of our uh, live videos, including this one, are saved on our website um, through YouTube, and they're also saved here on our Facebook page. Okay, I got it, I got it, you guys, I got it. I'll do it, I'll do it right after this, right after this. All right, you guys, I love you, and um, I'm so grateful that you're in my life and that we get to be with each other in this way. I'm gonna blow out our Christ candle, not to represent that the Christ of the light of Christ goes out, but to say to each and every one of us that our service time, our worship time is over, and our service in the world, however we do it in this weird time and place, is about to begin. Go and serve the Lord, my friends. Amen. <laughs>